as you know, we're looking at uh, a theme, a series entitled, As It Was in the Days of Lot. I pray that if you were here this morning, you were able to glean some of the similarities, Amen. but also the things that God would have us to do as Christians in these last days. And one of the things that God wants us to do is to be filled by spirit. That's right. So that we can be able to be in communion with heaven, but also have the power that God wants us to have. And, and that spiritual power, not that maybe it will give us physical power, I don't know. Uh, he has done that before. Yes. Uh, but spiritual power, not only, not only to overcome uh, the difficulties of this time, but to be a witness Amen. for Jesus Christ. One of the most inspiring individuals in Scripture for me, I didn't say the most, but one of is Moses. Moses finally fulfilled his calling at 80 years old. Who here is younger than 80? Then God still has a calling on your life. And Moses continued his ministry to he was 120. Who here is younger than 120? God still has work for you. Isn't that something? Because, and, and, and the Bible says of Moses that when he passed, right before he passed away, he passed away, his eyes were not what? Dim, yeah. neither was his strength what a it. So God kept him, didn't he? Yes. So God can use me at my young age because I am nowhere near 120. That's right. <laughs> so God can use you, everyone here, because no one here is near 120. That's right. So God wants to use you in these last days. Let us pray as we look at the title of the message, Seeking the Best for Myself. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we invite your spirit now to be with us. I pray that you hide me behind the cross of Calvary. Lord, help me to lift Christ up. That he and all men may be drawn unto him, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 There are some things that I'm going to share today that may bother some people. My intention is not to bother you, but my intention is to encourage you in the right direction. And sometimes that may mean that you may be a little bothered by something. And that is because that is the conviction of the Holy Spirit. You know that there's pro positive conviction and negative conviction. It means this. Sometimes we're convicted and we move in a positive direction. Sometimes we're convicted and we move in a negative direction because we're resisting the Spirit of the Lord. Several years ago, I uh, received a phone call, and this is a true story. It happened to a friend of mine because uh, there was a young lady who, uh, she was in her 30s. She uh, had missed work uh, for several days, and the family was trying to get in touch uh, with her. The job was calling, wondering where she was at. And finally, when they got to her home and they entered to the house, she was in her bedroom, her Facebook page was open and she was hanging over the side of the bed, mumbling these words, Facebook, Facebook, Facebook. And uh, they brought her to the hospital and she had to get a psychological evaluation. And, and they found out that the, the, the addiction to Facebook was so bad that it overpowered her mind. Is that something? Wow. It overpowered her mind, and she could not think, think straight. Yeah. True story. She had to get some psychological help. She was actually on the fourth floor of a psych ward for some time to try to get her mind back. This is what can. This is the power of technology on the mind today, and we need to be very careful how we deal with and we respond to technology. I believe that technology today can be used as a tool for good if, and to, to uh, spread the gospel throughout the world. But, but there's also some pitfalls and there's some dangers with, uh, with technology. Uh, I teach my family some time because often, because there's times, oh, I might have my phone with me, but we all have our little smartphones. I mean, a lot of us don't. Uh, and and uh, if we have our Facebook page, one thing we like to do, we like to take a selfie, right? Mm -hmm. And they say, the selfie, and we go, Facebook! Right? And we put it and we post it. And we have to be careful because the Bible says that men would be lovers of themselves. Right. And that's something. And so we like to post things about who? Ourselves. So it can be used as a tool to the enemy to bring attraction to who? Ourselves. To me. Yes. It's because it's all about me. And that's something. And if you notice, Jesus was, was much different than, than all of us. When, 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 when Jesus would heal somebody, wasn't this common? He healed, or do something, he said, tell no man what I've done, but go, right? He said, go and tell good, what good things God has done for you. Today in our ministries, we're like, 
What? I tell your story. It's Facebook! <laughs> right? And it's all about who? Us. About me <laughs> and my ministry <laughs> and ourselves. See, a tool that can be used for good sometimes can be used for what? The advantage of the, the enemy. And so we live in a world, this is where I ended up last time, a world of distractions. Don't we? we live in a world of distractions. Uh, I have a certification as a brain health coach. Uh, I, I love continuing education. I believe that we as people, human beings, should get continually educated. And, and I'll give you a little backdrop to why. I'm a board certified chaplain. And so as a chaplain, it's very rigorous. And every year you have to get 50 continuing units of education. Mm. That is a lot. And so the Lord is giving me wisdom. I said, if I'm going to take 50 CEUs, why don't I use it to get certified? <laughs> like in something, that's a lot of, so I may get 51 year and see and then go on and then I get a certification or, or a diploma. I said, I might as well get educated to, you know, like the process, not do 50 CEUs. So um, I went back to school and I went to the Amen Clinic. You can type in Amen Clinic. And I went to Dr. Daniel Amen and I got a certification and training in brain health coaching because I wanted to help people who have problems, right? Some mental ADD, ADHD, uh, hyperactivity, and all these things, you know, depression and anxiety. And so uh, I learned a lot about the brain. Um, I wish I, was, I would have taken a shorter course because it was less rigorous, but I took a course, and, and I think it was by Divine Providence. I didn't want to do this, but when I entered the course, I said, oh, no, it's the wrong course, meaning this. I took the course that was designed for medical doctors. Uh -oh. So I was like, oh no, I don't need all this information. <laughs> they gave me all this information, you know, you know, like anyway, and so I, uh, I'm finishing up, but I should have probably take, taken the shorter course. And so, but there I sit. And he writes a book, The End of Mental Illness. It's a very good book. There's some things that I disagree with, but the Bible is supposed to take that, which is good, right? And then the other, you say, no, I'm not going to practice this. And so I do know a lot about the brain and how it functions. Uh, but in the process, I have read some other books, The Hacking of the American Mind uh, by Dr. Robert Lustig, and you should read this book, a very good book. Uh, he, uh, Dr. Lustig, he's an endo endocrinologist, and he shows how there is a design uh, by America to really uh, negatively impact the human mind so that, it, so that they can control the human mind. And so it, it, it's a very good book. And then, of course, the book, The Lost Art of Thinking by Neil Nedley. Who here knows Dr. Neil Nedley? Uh, he's an Adventist doctor, he's a good doctor, and he talks about, you know, the mind. And, 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 and in his book, he shows us how to improve our, our EI, our emotional intelligence, so that we can achieve peak mental performance. I want to arrange things in my life so that I can have what peak mental performance, and I'll tell you why. The, the way that God communicates to us is through our what? Our mind. Right? And that's why Paul said, let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus. And Paul said in the book of Corinthians, he says, you have the mind of Christ. Jesus said in the book of Proverbs, says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. So do you see what I'm saying? The communication of God that takes place in our lives happens through what? Through our mind. So wouldn't it be advantageous to Satan to do whatever he can to intercept that communication, right, and get in the way, block the communication to our minds. And I believe he's doing that through technology and media. If we're not careful, it can overtake what? Our minds. And, and I'm going to show some things to you this morning. These are statistics found in uh, <clears throat> the book, or all three books, and listen, to, and listen to what they say. In the United States, almost half of adults, 46.4 uh, almost half of the adults, 46.4% will experience a mental illness during their lifetime. Wow. There's about 40 of us here. And can you imagine 20 of us in our lifetime having some sort of mental health issue? And there's a reason for that. 5% of adults, 18 or older, experience a mental illness in any one year, equivalent to 43.8 million people. That's a lot of people. And so now we wonder why we experience the state of affairs that we are today, right? There's a lot of what? Mental illness right. and, and, uh, that is pervading the land. Of adults in the United States with any mental disorder in a one year period, 14.4% of one have one disorder, 5.8% have two disorders, and 6% have three or more. Half of all mental disorders begin by age 14. 
and three quarters by the age of 24. Ooh. That means we need to do something to guard what? Guard our minds. And number five, in the United States, only 41% of the people who had a mental disorder in the past year received professional health care and other services, mental illness. I don't know if you <clears throat> heard this, just the other day in California, uh, at an amusement park, there, there was an individual, uh, you know they have those, uh, what do you call those, uh, not those ski rides, but, but, but they're very zip lines. Not, not zip line where, where, where you just sit and they transport you from one place to the other. That is called what? Tram. 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 That's right. That's what's called a tram. And so it was going from one place to the next. And, and there was a couple sitting and they said, that's interesting. Look at that fella. And a young man, he was about 25, 30, slid out and he was hanging from the tram. He was hanging, hanging, hanging. And then when he got about 50 feet up, he said, goodbye, oh. and, he, and he let go. And no one could discover or understand why this young man did that. Mental illness. It had to be mental illness. Just as a side, now it's time to hang. And then while people are watching, I'm going to let myself go. These are not uncommon stories, folks. This is happening all of Robert Lustig, in his book, The Hacking of the American Mind, writes this. A mind, watch this, that is attempting to focus on too many things. Isn't that what's happening? Have you ever seen somebody trying to text and drive and talk, yes. put on clothes and say yes. Yes. He says, focus is difficult at best. Too much input as the mind seeks to discover what is it best to pay attention to. Are you, fine? Are you following me? We need to learn how to just focus in on one thing. And the technology of, the, of today is very distracting because there's a lot of things that's just flashing on the screen that's trying to get our, our attention. Now watch what he says. This is Dr. Lustig. Watch this. Notifications from our phones are training our brains to be in a near constant state of stress and fear by establishing a stress-fear memory pathway. Have, have you seen it? I mean, I've seen it. A person sitting down in the room, bing, and they're like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're trying to talk to you, right? They're like. Yeah. Or they're driving here. And they're like, I gotta get to my phone. I gotta get to my phone. I gotta get to my phone. This doctor is right, right? A stress, fear, neural pathway. you think behind that? Listen, folks, it happened to me the other day, and this is the truth. I was sleeping, I was sleeping, and I thought I had my phone in my hand and that it was, and that it was vibrating. <laughs> I'm dead serious, I said, I said, I don't have my phone. This is real. And if we don't get it under control, it's going to control us. Yes. And this is what this doctor is saying. Now watch this. And this is a doctor. This is a medical doctor saying, be careful. Be careful what this is doing to your mind. This. He says, and such a state means that the prefrontal cortex, you know what the prefrontal cortex is? It is the front part of our brain, okay? That controls what? Our reasoning. Right from wrong. Our ability to process and make good, healthy decisions comes to our prefrontal cortex. It determines what is right and wrong. Are you following me? Women be advantageous for sitting and say, you know what, let me destroy that prefrontal cortex so they don't even know what's right from wrong. It will cause a person, right, to be going down a tram and decide, you know what, let me just hang from here. Prefrontal cortex? Right out of one. This is what the doctor says, okay? And such a state means that the prefrontal cortex, the part of our brain that normally deal with the with some of our highest order of cognitive functioning goes completely haywire and basically it shuts down. Mm. 
This results in people doing things that they would not normally do that get them in a lot of trouble. Mm -hmm. This is a endocrinologist speaking here. You think he knows what he's talking about? And then in the book, he begins to warn people, say, please, be careful how you use your technology. I think this guy was getting himself in a lot of trouble. <laughs> He's trying to eat, and drive, and text, and talk. My youngest son, Micah, a few years ago, he's 14 now, and he was about 9 to 10, he said, Man, Dad, you should see yourself when you get engaged with that phone. It's like your eyes are just bugging out. <laughs> Let me tell him, he said, he said, you should see your eyes. He said, they're just looking and looking. <laughs> he said, and I can come up to you and ask you some questions, and you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> this is what's happening. This stuff will drive us, what? See, what happens to the human mind when we engage with too much input to the ways of technology is that our dopamine level, you've heard of dopamine, right? It goes up. And when it comes down, dopamine is our, our feel good. It feel good. And so when it goes down, it says, give me another shot. Give me another shot. Give me another shot. Give me another shot. And you keep desiring this input of dopamine. And that's why you keep going back, back for more, back for more. And then what happens is that your cortisol level, it goes down. And your serotonin level goes up. And it creates in the mind, follow me, this is important. It creates in this mind a desire for pleasure. And that's what results in addiction. Because you want that pleasure, you want that feel good. And I feel good. I feel good. And I feel good again. Are you following that? And so some medical doctors have said that it is just as bad as being on cocaine. Mm -hmm. And so, tell them, when you go to your kid, guess what I got for you? Mm. I got you something that is going to open the world to you. And they're like, thank you, Dad. you just giving them about a pound of cocaine. Mm. <laughs> and you say, no, nah, don't worry. It's not going to affect them. This doctor said it's going to. And he says, it has. And he said, that's what's going on with the Americans today. <coughs> he said, their minds have been hacked. And you know what? Some people don't want to hear this. And you know why they don't want to hear it? Because the dopamine level is high. They say, oh, don't take my cocaine from me. <laughs> but really, they say, hey, man, don't take my stuff from me. And so, they say, don't even talk to me about it. But I'm saying, this is what I'm saying to you today. I'm in the trenches with you. Because I've got trapped too at one point in my life. I got sucked in. And I'm learning. You know what I'm learning. I'm still going through the process of coming home, taking my cell phone and putting it in the cell phone bin, suffering from withdrawals like everybody else. Going, man, I want to look at that thing. God said, man, you got to get that under control. <coughs> so I'm not pointing a finger at you. I'm saying, we're in this thing together. We need to pray for one another, and we need to get out of this mess. The best communication and the most effective communication that we can ever have is through the heavenly intelligence, and that is with Jesus Christ. Let him download something into your brain. Amen. Amen. Are you following me? Yes. Now watch this, OK? This is what I wanted to establish in the beginning moments of this message. Satan is after our mind so he can place our mind in the position of wanting pleasure. 
and never being content by imbalancing the hormones in our, and the and neurotransmitters in our brain. Are you following me? Because then he can position us so that we will be lovers of pleasure mm. more than lovers of God. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Are you following that? He's been studying humanity for, for, for thousands and thousands of years. So he said, hmm, let me see how I can do this. And we're just falling prey to him. Are you following me? That's what I'm trying to establish. That needs to be established right here. He wants us to be with those that seek lovers of pleasure. To be lovers of pleasure. And he's doing it through the human mind. And he's using technology. Are you following? Okay. Listen to what it says, it says here. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, what else did they do? They drank, they brought, they sold, they planted, they built lovers of what? Pleasure. Right? But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed who? Them all. Even so it would be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. What are we saying here? When the, man, when the Son of Man is revealed, we're going to be in the state of affairs where our minds will what, what? be distracted. Mm -hmm. Jesus said it in Luke 19. He said, be careful that you're not distracted by the things of this world. Right or wrong? Right. That's right. right. So, back in the days of Lot and today, the people suffered from a tefid, attention deficit disorder yeah. for the things of God. Right. right? There was this ADD. There was that attention deficit disorder for the things of God, right? Yeah. They were, and they ate, they drank, they brought, they sold. They weren't paying attention to God. And as we established earlier, they had heard of the days of Noah. Yeah. And they just said, you know what? Just put, let me put that behind me. And they didn't place their attention on God. They placed their attention on the things of this world. Mercy. And so what took place is that they had spiritual ADD. Are you following? Because their minds were in what? It was in the right place. Watch this. Lot went out to warn his children. Now, if you want to look at the account, this, this is taking place in Genesis. Like say, you say, well, you know what the Bible has to say? Yeah, but you know that. That's just capturing what the Bible says. <clears throat> Genesis chapter, <clears throat> I believe it's 19 or 17. Let me just get there real quick. Okay. 20. Okay. Genesis chapter 19. And in Genesis 19, the Bible says that Lot goes to get his children, right? Uh, um, you want to put this light off for me because it's, 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 it's a little... There you go. There you go. Here. Look at verse 12. 1912. That was a good year I heard, but I wasn't around. <laughs> Genesis 19:12. Then the men said to Lot, Have you anyone else here? Because they're saying we're going to destroy the city. They're saying what we want to do is we want to save you and anyone else who would be saved. Have you anyone, son-in-law, your sons, your daughters, and whomever you have in the city, take them out of this place? Okay, this is what the angel was telling, telling Lot, right? Whoever you have in the city that you want to get out, get them out of here. Okay, now watch this, verse 13. For we will destroy this place because the outcry against them have grown great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law, who had married his daughters-in-law, or well, excuse me, his daughters, and said, get up and get out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be what? King James will say, mocking. And the new King James will say, he's just kidding, joking. So when Lot came to them, right, and he said, listen, we've got to, you've got to get out of this city. 
This city's going to be destroyed by God. The end of the world has come. This is it. They said, <laughs> Man, you're crazy. <coughs> right? And the Bible said they mocked him. They mocked him. Like, really? Hmm. Yeah, the end of the world. They've been saying that since the beginning of time. The end of the what happened to Noah and his people? That is not going to happen this time. You fool. Basically, do you see what I'm saying? What's happening today? <coughs> right? With all due respect. Because I believe God loves everybody. LGBTQ. Right? Say, uh, God loves me. God would not. And God's going to have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. And say, I'm sorry for what I did. Right or wrong? God wants us all to be saved. God loves us all. God is love. But God wants us call, to call us to a higher calling in life and to be saved in honest, honesty and purity. You follow? Why has it? Has this puzzled you? We are in the state of, of a pandemic throughout the world. Aren't we? And how come no one from the White House has stepped down and said, or stepped up and said, you know, Americans, we need wisdom. We don't have it. We need it from God. The next 40 days is going to be 40 days of prayer. We're going to ask God to show us how to solve this problem. Hadn't that puzzled you? You'd say, hey, can't somebody ask God to help us? You know why? We don't need God, that's what we're saying. We can figure this out ourselves. As it was in the days of what? Noah. As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be the coming of the Son of Man. We, and today's Christian, true Christians, are being mocked by the world. It comes to one who was mocking. Now watch this. Listen to the commentary now. <clears throat> Lot went out to warn his children. He repeated the words of the, the angel. Get up out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed to them as one that mocked. They laughed at what they call his superstitious fears. They said, what are you afraid of? Come on, Dad. Why don't you sit down and have dinner with us? This city's going to be fine. Okay, here it is. His daughters were influenced by their husband. Be not unequally yoked. They were well enough off, they were well enough off where they were. They could see no evidence of danger. Everything was just as it had been. They had great possessions. Are, are you finding the commentary? They had great possessions. Mm -hmm. And they could not believe it possible that beautiful Sodom would be destroyed. Lot returned sorrowfully to his home and told the story to his wife of his family. He said, honey, they're not going to come. They're not going to come. They're not going to come. Let's see in a moment who was the cause, the real cause, of these children losing their way. Watch. We're going to be straight from the Word of God that something took place prior to this moment that caused his own daughters to say, get out of here, Dad. You're a joke. Do you think that that hurt the heart of Lot? Woo! Man, my daughters are going to burn up in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he told his wife, he said, I tried, honey. I tried. I pleaded with them. All they could do is laugh. And in the next message we hear, remember Lot's wife. There was something behind all this. The reason why Lot's wife was back. There's a reason for it. That's why Jesus said, remember. He doesn't want us to remember the incident, the place. He said, Jesus wanted, wanted us to remember what took place that led to her looking back. Are you following me? Okay. You see, in the book, The Church in Babylon, it says this, page 261, a very good book, by the way. It says, we have too much noise and not enough quietness. Too many videos and emails and too much television, internet, media, attraction. Let us regularly turn off the noise to contemplate God in private worship and scriptural 
meditation and I add it and memorization. See, you see what God is asking us to do? To step aside from those things that are distracting our mind and place our focus back on Him. Watch this. Then the angels bade him arise and take his wife and the two daughters that were yet in the house and leave the city. A lot delayed. A lot delayed. Verse 15, Genesis 19, it says, When the morning dawned, the angel urged Lot to hurry, saying, Arise, take your wife and the two daughters who are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. And while he lingered, the man took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his daughters, the Lord being merciful to him. Yes. And they brought them out and set him out of the city. Verse 17, so it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, they said, Escape for your life. Do not what? Look back. Look back. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. Then Lot said to them, Please, no, my lords. You see God's mercy? The Bible says, Lot did what? He hesitated. And the angel of mercy said, let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. Let's get out of here. And drag the lives. With all that was going on, Lot hesitated. Mm. Got a question for you today. You don't have to answer this. Are you hesitating? Mm. With everything that's going on in the world, are you hesitating? Are you wondering, well, maybe, or, you know, I'm going to lose out on, and, oh, well, ah, you know what, I still, oh, but I want to go to college. Uh, you know, but I want, oh, but this guy, oh, this woman, but I want to get married. But those are all good things, right? Education is good. Getting is a good thing, right? But it's the Lord saying, come on, let's get out of here. Is it because we're so distracted by the things of this life that we can't focus in on what? God, and we're suffering from spiritual what? We have this attention deficit for the things of deficiency for, for the things of God. Watch this. But Lot delayed, though daily distressed by beholding deeds of violence. He had no true conception of the debasing and abominable iniquity practiced in that vile city. He did not realize the terrible necessity for God's judgment to be put a check on sin. This is Lot. Some of his children clung to Sodom and his wife refused to depart without them. This is some family conflict going on, isn't there? Yeah. There's turmoil going on in this house. And she's saying, well, you gotta, and, and they're saying, and the angel's just like, listen, we've gotta get out of here. Because God is merciful, right? Yes. And in, in, in spite of our hesitancy and our resistance, sometimes God says, listen, this, I've got to save you. Now, they could have resisted more. They could have said, just get off of this, right? But the Bible, what, what the Bible is showing us is that there was some of that giving in to the Spirit, right? They said, oh, yeah, okay, finally I'll, and I'll do this. Are you following me? Yes. Are you with me? Okay. The thought of leaving those whom he held dearest on the earth seemed more than he could bear. Mm -hmm. It's a decision. It's just a lie. Watch this. Patient prophet, page 137. That's where I got this from. It was hard to forsake, forsake his luxurious home and all the wealth acquired by the labors of his whole life. It's not like he's focusing on himself, isn't he? To go forth a destitute wanderer stupefied with sorrow. Is it, am I going to leave this behind? He lingered, loath to depart. But for the angels of God, they would have all perished in the ruin of Sodom. But for what? The 
heavenly messengers took him with his wife and his daughters by the hand and led them what? Remember what she said? Living in that wicked city, in the midst of unbelief, his faith had grown there. How long you going to stay in Indianapolis? I got a friend, I told you his name, David Negron. I talked to him the other day. He lives in Philadelphia. The city of love, brotherly love. It's a wicked city. And he lives on East Tioga Street. You bring it up on the internet. East Tioga Street, Philadelphia, crime rate. And you'll say, ooh, what is he doing there? I told him the other day, I said, hey, man, when you get out of the city? He said, man, you're right. Man, you're right. Still, still got some things I got to take care of. I said, man, you get out of that city. That is what the city life will do. It'll make your faith go dim. But guess what? And, I, and, I'm, and I'm saying this respectfully, but now we have devices that we can still get into the city through the internet. We we'll watch everything that's going on in the city. And we become part of the city living out of the country. <laughs> and so we're still in the city. We have to find a way, you see what I'm saying, to detach from the things of this life. Because if we don't, what's going to happen? Our faith is going to what? Yeah. And we're going to desire the things of the world. So, where did this all begin? That's a good question. Where did this all begin for life? Did it just happen in a vacuum? Very suddenly, right? Why? 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 Turn to Genesis 13. Genesis 13. Verse 13. In Genesis 13, what we find out is that Abraham and, and Lot are living together in the same place, or the same country, the same property, or the same land, the same terrain. Are you following me? And their, their herdsmen and their cattle start to grow, and something takes place. They've Abram very, very politely says, look, and you can read it there. He says, look, wherever you look and whatever property you want, you take it and I'll go the other way. You go first. Are you following me? He says, you can go again and you choose and I'll just choose whatever you don't choose. I'll go the other way. Now watch what happened. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abraham's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle and the Canaanites and the Pezzarites well there in the land. And that is verse 7. Right? And Abraham said to Lot, verse 8, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and your, uh, between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If you take to the left, then I'll take to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I'll go to the left. And now watch what happens. And Lot, lifted up his eyes and he beheld the plains of Jordan and it was well watered. He said, hmm, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the God of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor. Then Lot chose him for the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east and they separated themselves the one from the other. And Abraham dwelt, or Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent, his tent towards Sodom. Now watch this. But the men of Sodom were wicked and sinners before the Lord. What? Exceedingly. Huh. You see what Lot did? He looked around and said, I'm going to get the best for myself. Right? He said, man, I'm going to get the best for myself. He was thinking about who? Himself. And he said, you know what? Not only is this terrain so wonderful and beautiful and attractive, 
it's close to a city. And there's so much advantages to being out here, but living close as what? To this city. And Lot sought the best for himself. Listen to the commentary. Although Lot owed his prosperity to his connection with Abraham, he manifested no gratitude to his benefactor. Courtesy would have dictated that he yield the choice to Abraham. You see, Abraham was so gracious and kind. He took him under, he took his nephew into his household and took care of him. He watched as when Abraham traveled that he would raise an altar to the Lord and, and, and pray to God and seek God's will and guidance. But Lot would have none of that. He was discourteous and he had no gratitude towards his uncle. He should have said, Unc, you choose first because you've done so much for me. His uncle said, you choose first. He said, thank you. This is the property that I want. You go the other way. He was choosing the best for himself. And there was consequences to that, wasn't there? Do you see, what, do you see the consequences that take place because of our self What can happen? But instead of his... But instead of this, he selfishly endeavored to grasp all its advantages. He was thinking about who? He said, okay, uncle, I'm going to grab this. Oh, I'm going to get the best of everything. Go ahead. You can go the other way. He lifted up his eyes and behold all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. It's taken from page of the prophets, page 111. Even at the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zor, the most fertile region in all Palestine was the Jordan Valley, reminding the beholders of the Lord's paradise and equally, and equaling the beauty and productiveness of the Nile in rich plains they had so lately left. There were cities also wealthy and beautiful, inviting to profitable traffic in their crowded barns, dazzled with the visions of worldly gain. Lot overlooked the moral and spiritual evils that would be encountered there. All he could see is what he could get from what? Himself. The inhabitants of the plain were sinners before the Lord exceedingly. But of this he but of this he was ignorant or knowing, gave it but little weight. He chose him all the plains of Jordan and pitched his tent toward Sodom. This is the last sentence. And how little did he foresee the terrible results of that selfish choice. <laughs> now we understand what went through his heart and mind when he came back, talked to his wife, remember? He said, I, I failed. In his mind, he realized their choice was the result of my choice. And now, I've got to leave this place, and my two daughters will die in this city. And we've got to think about the choices that we're making today, don't we? For too long, we've been thinking, okay, let me make best choice for myself. And I'm telling you, where we have made mistakes, we better repent of them, talk to our children, right? And say, listen, I know I've made some mistakes. And I know that you're in this place because of the choices I've made. Please get out. Please forgive me. And let's all get out of here. And let's all go up there together. I mean, this stuff is profound. Now we understand what was going on in Lot's mind and heart and why his wife was so turmoil over this and why she what? Look back. 
their hearts were torn. And they realized that it went back to the decisions that they made in life. You see, there was a difference between Abraham and Lot, wasn't there? That was a big difference. The Bible says, Genesis 12, 8, it's a commentary on, on Abraham's life. Watch this. And he removed from thence unto a mountain the, on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Hai, Hai, Hai on the east, and there built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. You see, Abraham was different. Abraham had to make a decision, raise up an altar, he called upon the name of the Lord. He said, God, direct my life. My life is yours. We're not going to get into this, this message. But do you know that even when his nephew was in trouble, remember when the six kings came, came together and then and there was that big war, and then they had captured his nephew? The Bible said that when Abraham got a word that his nephew was in trouble, Abraham didn't say, he get, he get what he deserved. He needs to be arrested. He needs to be in jail. He needs to be captured. Oh, Abraham had such a heart of love. He said, where's my name? And he got his men together. And he went to war to get his nephew back. I think that's the attitude that we need to take to those in our family that are lost, right? right. Where is he? We get my stuff together, son. Go out trying to rescue them from disaster. They've been captured by the enemy. But I'm going to do whatever I can by God's grace to set them free. That was Abraham. Abraham had a heart of love, didn't he? Abraham was much different than you and me. I think you and I would have said, huh? Well, let him stay there for a week. Maybe so he can think that thing over. Well, you know what? Made the bad, not lying. Abraham said, we'll go get my name. Because Abraham was a man of prayer. And, and the spirit could speak to him and say, listen, I'll we'll catch you up. Your nephew now. The difference between Lot and Abraham. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abraham called on the name of the Lord. Over and over again, what do we find Abraham doing? Calling upon the name of the Lord is a big difference. Then Abraham moved his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. Everywhere Abraham goes, he's building an altar unto who? Unto the Lord. Yeah, there's a big difference, isn't there? Lot's building an altar unto himself, <laughs> and Abraham is building an altar unto who? Unto the Lord. This is what she says here in Faith and the Prophets. The children of God, the world over, are one family. And the same spirit of love and conciliation should govern them. What spirit should govern us? The spirit of what? And what? Conciliation. Always wanting to reconcile things. And then she quotes, Be kindly affectionate one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Right? That that would have done a lot very well, right? If he would have preferred, said, okay, in honor, I'm going to prefer you, you choose first. Is the teaching of our Savior the cultivation of a uniform courtesy, a willingness to do to others as we would wish them to do to us, would annihilate half of the ills of life. Whoa! You want to cut your troubles in half? Start being nice to people. That's what she's saying, just start being nice to people. Right? If you're walking into the straw, hold the door open for someone. Right? It's like my wife told me when my children were little. You know, I would say, Michael, you know, Joe, hold the door open for your mother. You know, they're five, six, hold it. My wife had to come in and say, like, they'll start holding the door open for me when you start holding it open. Right? I'm asking them to do something. She said, you don't do that, so you're asking them to hold the door open. 
They said, they, they watched you and they go, let's all go inside together. <laughs> Leave mom outside. <laughs> I said, you're right. I said, oh, okay, this is the way we do this. And they, they learn from what they what? My wife, in a very nice way, has told me, she hasn't used the word, but what she's trying to say, you're everywhere, right? But, but she did it nicely. Hold the door for me, so then they hold the door for me, right? She could have been mean and said, you're a hypocrite. You don't have to do it yourself, right? Thank God for a wife with wisdom and who knows how to cut to the heart in a nice way. Okay. The spirit of self-aggrandizement is the spirit of Satan. Right? All for self. But the heart in which the love of Christ is cherished will possess the charity which seeks not her own. Such will heed the divine injunction, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. We have to learn to take care of our neighbors. And sometimes those neighbors are the one that are very old. Are you following? Okay. It's my daughter, Hannah. And uh, I love her very much. She's, she's growing up, and we've been having a lot of conversations. And I've tried to tell her that lately I've been telling her every small thing you do has, has some sort of ramification. I said, it's, it's building character in one way or another. This is what Ms. Spice says. Every act of life, however small, has its bearing for good or for evil. Everything that we do has bearing for good or for evil. Lot, how did Lot get to where he was? Sodom, losing his children, facing loss, he made a decision, right? Step by step, uncle, thanks. I'm going to take everything for myself. And that decision, right, had consequences for the rest of his life. One small act, every act of life, however small, has its burden for good or for evil. Page and prophet, page 134. This is what you're allowed to say. Faithfulness or neglect is what are apparently the smallest duties. Faithfulness or neglect in what are apparently the smallest duties may open the door for life's richest blessings or its greatest calamities. It is little things that test the character. It is the unpretending acts of daily self-denial performed with a cheerful, willing heart that God smiles upon. We are not to live for self, but for others. And it is not only by self-forgetfulness, by cherishing a love, helpful, a loving, helpful spirit, that we can make our life a blessing. This is the other thing. The little attentions, the small, simple courtesies, go far to make up the sum of life's happiness. And the neglect of these constitute no share, small share of human wretchedness. Do you understand what they're saying? It is the little things that we need to be grateful for. Right? And we need to do good for others. And we'll be seeking to, uh, how can I benefit humanity in a, a very helpful way? That's what she's saying. Look at that. We need to pay attention to the small, simple courtesies. Thank you. I appreciate that. That was nice of you. Oh, you need a ride? You need some help? Sure. Oh, this is going on in the church? How can I help? And if everybody does something small for each other and for our neighbors, guess what? We impact the world in a big way. That's right. Amen. But when we don't do these things, what happens? We share. And you mean what? End of the story. I'm going to make a comment, and then we'll tell the story. We have to come to the place in our lives where God helps us to be a selfless group of people. We need to be selfless individuals. Are you following me? We have to come to the place where we sit down and we say, you know what? This is not about me. 
This is about what God wants to do in my life and the life of others. Are you following me? Like, is that clear? Yeah. You know, we've got to come to the place where we sit down and we say, Lord, save me from myself and fill me with your spirit so I can love like you and respond like you and be like you in all things. That's right. We need to come to the place but we have such confidence in God that whatever God asks us to do with other little sacrifices that we have to make, we just make them. Are you following me? We need to come to a place where we come together as a church body and where things need to be mended, we just mend them. And where I've made a mistake, I say, brother, you know what, I was wrong. That was very selfish of me. I'm sorry. And then tell him, brother, what can I do to make this right? I'm willing to do it. And don't be fearful of that. And say, okay, let's work together. And if we're both in this mode of being unselfish, guess what? We'll work that thing out. But if we're like Lot, and he says, I go, oh yeah, I can tell you what you can do to make this right. You say, man, I'm going to take advantage of this. And what did we just hear? That is the spirit of the devil. Oh, do we like Jesus? Are you fucking me? we got to come to that point in our lives. But we are so selfless that Christ can just channel his life through us and just impact all of you. Listen, if just a group of people could get into a room on the day of Pentecost and pray and say, you know what? We just want to be like Jesus. And that spirit to come in. And Peter, remember Peter, right? Peter was a very selfish individual. He was always thinking about, how can we get the advantage? I'm going to stop this. I mean, Peter would have made a very good Seven day on this. He would have been a good head out. Like, Man, I'm gonna guard this place with a sword. Boom! And boom! Yeah! Man, I, I, just, I just love feeling like this. I'm the guardian of Christ. What did Christ say? Man, put that thing away. And the very person that Peter thought was the enemy. Christ picked up the ears. Because mm -hmm. God's love. And those people came with swords, sticks, and so on and so forth to arrest him and take the cow. He said, oh, no, 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 no. This, this, this is not the way that we went to kingdom by cutting people out. And Peter was so full of himself, what did he say? Lord, all oh, men for safety. I'll never do. Bible says, Jesus said, Peter, you don't, you don't understand how selfish you are. How full of yourself you are. And I'm paraphrasing. He said, man, before that close to time, before it close, what? The night of Christ. The Bible says, as that thing unfolded, Peter still didn't know what's going on. Until, read the book of Matthew. The Bible says, he looked, crowed, right? Like the rooster went off, go. He said he saw the face of Christ and he wept because he remembered. He remembered. And you know where, where that all started? Oh, it started early in Christ's ministry. But it could have been prevented where? Did you know where? Garden of Gethsemane when he said, just pray with me. He said, the spirit is in the deep will of the flesh. We pray, Peter. Pray. Peter went to sleep. But God still just, Jesus woke up, right? I mean, Jesus got up his knees. They woke up. He said, come on, now we must move forward into my father's business. He didn't say, man, you guys fall asleep. Man, you're the worst group of folk a man could ever have. You didn't see that come out of Jesus. Jesus wasn't negative. He said, what is it? It's all I have. And Jesus worked with what he had. And 
through it all, he showed love, right? Yes. You see that? Through it all, he just showed love and mercy and kindness. On the day of Pentecost, the Spirit got a hold of Peter, and he was one of the first people to speak up. Yeah. See, God can use our character and our personality, right? right? And form it so that he can still use that individual the way he was made to be. That's, That's right. like Paul. Paul wreaked havoc on the what? Church? The Holy Spirit got a hold of him, and then he wreaked havoc against the enemy. You, you see that? Peter was bold and ready to speak up. The Spirit got a hold of him. He was still bold and ready to speak up for Jesus. So we fight in our own armor that has been sanctified through the Holy Spirit. You see what I'm saying? I'm a different type of fellow. And many probably say, yes, you are. But this is what God has made me. Because I used to run the streets. Brooklyn, New York, all those. And so I still run the streets. Ah, ah, ah. But in a sanctified way. Amen. You know, like for Jesus. That's right. Some people say, man, you're so street smart. Man, you need to. I said, that's the way God made me. To just really be amongst just anybody. See, I can walk in the house. It could be, it could be all messed up. And shreds. Smell like urine. And, 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 and feces. And I'm in there. Am I okay? Yeah. How you doing, man? And people are like, man, we gotta get out. Say, no, no, we got here. You know why? Because I used to live like that. I used to be poor. Mine was like to have nothing. And somebody needs to go to the house and people have nothing. That's right. Just because you can save for that doesn't mean you don't go back into it and save people. That's right. Uh, some of you are saying, be quiet. Okay, so here we go. About a year and a half ago, we were on the Father's Son between me and my sons and some other men. And we, one of the activities that we engaged in was we went down to a lake and we were going to take a ride out to the waters. It was a very cold day in November. And the waters would get really cold in Wisconsin. Who has heard about the, 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 the temperatures in Wisconsin? Temperatures in Wisconsin, mm -hmm. it gets cold. It gets so cold that there's some weeks that go 40 below for two weeks and not go up or down just yet. Why? I can tell you some, like a lot of stories of how the Lord saved my life because I was ignorant of the cold and then I was outside and I said, man, why are my ears burning? Why? Like, yeah, it's not. It's fucking frostbite. Oh, that's what that is. Okay. But, so we were out there. Father Son Retreat. We're starting to go out in the lake. And as each person is getting to the boat, you say, oh, wait, wait, remember the water's cold, everyone. Make sure you put on your life jackets, because if any of these boats tip, you know, you want to be able to at least keep yourself above water, and then someone will see you, and then they'll come help you. So most of the men went out, and they were out in the waters, and they kind of disappeared. And me, okay, it was my son and I, it was, Dr. Tim, and uh, there was someone else, I can't remember the person's name, they were there with us. While we were there, some other young men came and started to get their little boats together to go out. By divine providence, as we watched them, we said, oh, wait, 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 wait. Don't go in that water without any life jackets, because if that thing tips over, are you following me? He said, man, you guys, it'll get so cold that you might drown. So they go out, and, they, and they're going way out, and myself, Joshua, Dr. Kronick are, are, are talking, and there's somebody else, I, I can't remember who it was. And as we're talking, we hear, help, help. And we look, and we said, man, the boat capsized. Dr. Kronick and my son jump in another boat and they start rowing towards them. I'm talking to my son as he's getting in the boat and I'm saying, Josh, whatever you do, if they are scared or nervous and pulling, don't pull anybody out because they'll pull you in. And he's like, okay, dad, okay, 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 okay. And he's smiling, okay, dad, it's, it's okay, it's good, it's good. And Come out on my children. He's going out and I'm saying, Josh, now remember, if they're acting crazy, don't grab anybody. Just talk to them and calm them down. I said, take these life jackets, give it to them. I mean, you know, just give them stuff to hold on. He's like, okay, 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 okay. 
and I'm watching. A lady comes out and she says, uh, I heard some yelling. And she said, my two sons, they went out about an hour ago and I can't find them. Are those my boys? I said, I don't know. And then another family member of hers comes and says, no, they didn't walk in this direction. They walked in another direction. She said, oh, thank God. She said, but whoever's out there needs help. And so I'm watching and we're waiting. And I'm going, man, I hope they're going to be all right. And I'm trying to yell. I, you know, I see some kind of struggling out there. And I say, Josh, remember, don't try to pull anybody in if, if they're acting all type of crazy, you know, so, 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 so on and so forth. He says, okay, okay. And I see them finally pull them in, get them on the boat, and they start rowing back to shore. When they get back to shore, look what happens. One of the gentlemen, they were in the water. Second gentleman was in the water. This is my son. Who doesn't have a life jacket? Who doesn't have a life jacket? Are you following the story? My son did not have a life jacket. That mother as the boat was coming close to shore, she said, that's my son. She started crying. I said, everything's gonna be okay, man. Got him in the boat. When that boy got out of the boat, the mother just hugged him and said, oh, what were you thinking? He said, Mom, I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. I'm gonna be okay. It's gonna be all right. I pulled my son over and I said, son, Share with me, what made you do what you did? I said, do you realize that you didn't have a life jacket on? Mm -hmm. And my son said, Dad, those folks needed help. And there was no other way. He said, Dad, as I was rowing out there, he said, I realized too, I said, oh, the life jacket. He said, but I began to pray. And I said, Lord, help me. And when I get there, give me wisdom. And Lord, if they need help, help me to help them. He said, he said, as we were going out, off to the lake, I said, you know what? God is going to have to be the one that makes this rescue. He said, and they struggled, and they carried on, and I remember what you said. He said, but I started to pull, and I said, Lord, help me. He said, I got him onto the pole. You see, my friends, we're told that it is the unpretending acts of daily self-denial performed with a cheerful, willing heart that God smiles upon. We're told we are not to live for self, but to live for others. We are told it is only by self, what? Forgetfulness. By sharing a loving, helpful spirit that we can make our life a blessing. We can't go about living life seeking the best for ourselves. Amen. Because if we do, it will render us ineffective in this life for Jesus Christ. Yeah. Listen to what we're told. Patriot Prophet, page 132. And his noble and unselfish spirit, woo, so far into the self-seeking inhabitants of South, was another evidence of the superiority of the religion which he had honored by its courage and his fidelity. You know what she's talking about? Abraham. Watch. Now I did not know that they're true character. Well, watch this. But politeness and hospitality were habitual with him. Watch this. 
They were part of his religion, lessons that he had learned from the example of Abraham. Thank you, Uncle. Thank you, Jesus. He had not cultivated a spirit of courtesy. Had he not cultivated a spirit of courtesy, he might have been left to perish with the rest of Sodom. What's that like? He learned to be what? Isn't that something? Was he perfect? Nah, did he make some wrong decisions? No. But he did have a spirit of love and courtesy in him, and that's what saved him. Ooh. And now the last night of Sodom was approaching. Already the clouds of dungeons cast their shadows over the divided city. But men perceived it not. While angels drew near on their mission of destruction, men were dreaming of prosperity and pleasure. The last day was like every other that had gone, come and gone. Evening fell upon a scene of loveliness and security. A landscape of unrivaled beauty was bathed in the rays of declining sun. The coolness of the eventide had called forth the inhabitants of the city. Pleasure-seeking throngs, the what? Living life for themselves. The pleasure-seeking throngs were passing to and fro, intent upon the enjoyment of the hour. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be at the coming of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married. Why? They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came to destroy them all. Likewise, as it was in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they brought, they sold, they planted, they built. And on that day, a lot went out of sight of the rain, fire, and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even so it will be today. Very plain. Pleasure seekers, those seeking the best for themselves, respectfully, I must say, they're going to be lost. Those that live the selfless, the selfless life in Jesus Christ will be a bright light to others and will be saved and will save others. Because their light of love and gratitude and their example of obedience to God will be in a be a very appealing, be a very appealing characteristic to win the hearts and souls of many. I want to be like Jesus. How about you? Yes. I want that love to flow out of my heart. I want it to flow out of my heart in my home, in the workplace, in the church place, in the grocery place. Everywhere I go, when I'm on vacation, when I'm on a father-son retreat, and everywhere I go, people can sense, man, is there something different? This person is filled with the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. you know, the only thing that we're going to take to heaven is our character. Yes. Right. Right. May God help us today is my prayer. If that's your prayer with me, why don't you stand? This will be close this time of prayer. The hour is late. It's 115, so I'll close. And when I close, I'll pray for the blessing of God upon us that we, as we reconsecrate and rededicate ourselves to the Lord. But I also pray for the food. I think there's food in that. Yes. So, so I'm not even pray for that. Uh, um, did you have an announcement or something? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Just come to be blessed. Okay. Great. Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father,